Are you afraid to surrender your life to God because you are afraid that He would direct your life in a way that is not as good as the direction you could give to your life yourself? Also, how is it that some people whom God is leading suffer poverty or sickness or pain when God has the power to alleviate all these conditions? Stay tuned. We'll investigate this most interesting subject. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. Why does God allow things like suffering, sickness, and pain, and trials when He is all-powerful? For thousands of years, philosophers have debated this question. We will see in the Bible in just a few moments some of the reasons what God's Word tells us about this problem. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to help us by His Holy Spirit to understand the message of the Scriptures. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible that points out to us the meaning of what we see happening and of what we experience ourselves, and also points us to the future, to a time when there will be no more death and no more suffering or sickness or pain. Help us to understand what we are to do to be ready for that time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's free book is entitled, Darkness Before Dawn. To receive your free copy, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer IM23. This powerful book describes in vivid detail the coming world crisis, why and how most of the world will be deceived, and the plain evidence from the Bible that will keep you from being deceived. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH to receive your free copy of Darkness Before Dawn. And now, Pastor John Grossball. We read the following account in Matthew 14, verses 1 to 5. It says, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. John the Baptist told him the truth. It's not permitted, it's not allowed for you to have your brother's wife. That's forbidden not only in the seventh commandment, but in the tenth commandment. Man is forbidden to covet the wife of his neighbor. But although John told him the truth, Herodias bound Herod more firmly in her toils. He sought for a time, perhaps, to get free, but he didn't. She fastened him in her clutches, and he was influenced by Herodias to put John in prison. Now, John's life prior to that time had been one of active labor, and his inaction in prison weighed heavily upon him, and as week after week passed, he became despondent, and one of the reasons that he became despondent was if Jesus was the Messiah and Jesus was there right now, why did Jesus not do something to affect his release? Why did Jesus permit his faithful herald to be deprived of liberty and perhaps of life? John's disciples talked to him and they didn't do any good. In fact, they helped him to become more despondent and discouraged. They couldn't understand either why Jesus did not do something to deliver their master. Neither John the Baptist nor his disciples understood the nature of Christ's kingdom. They were looking for him to come to take the throne of David, to claim kingly authority. They were looking for him to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. They were looking for a God that would answer by fire, just like Elijah was. John had dared to face King Herod with the plain truth, the rebuke of sin. He had not counted his life dear to himself. 
But now the reports he's hearing is that Jesus is just spending every day healing and teaching, eating at the tables of the publicans, and every day the Roman yoke seems to be heavier upon the people, and Herod and his vile paramour do whatever they want, and the cries of the poor and suffering went up to heaven. There are many people feeling similar to that today. And to John the Baptist, all of this seemed to be a great mystery. John the Baptist had been bitterly disappointed by the results of his mission. He had expected that when he brought to the people a message from God, it would have the same effect as when the law was read to the Jewish people in the days of Josiah or of Ezra. He was expecting that there would be a deep-seated work of repentance, that there would be a returning to the Lord, that there would be a vital reformation following a revival. But he had not seen his hopes realized. Still, he did not surrender his faith in Christ. He could remember the voice from heaven that he had heard. He could remember the descending dove. He could, res he could remember the spotless purity of Jesus that he had observed and the power of the Holy Spirit that rest upon him at Jesus' baptism. So he decided he wouldn't talk anything about his doubts or anxieties to his disciples. He would just send his disciples to Jesus with a message and try to find word from Christ himself. And he was hoping that Jesus would have something to say to him, something that could give him hope and courage. And so he sent his disciples to Jesus with the following message. It's recorded in Matthew 11. It says, When John had heard in the prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one? or do we look for another? Actually, a very discouraging report if you were in Jesus' position. Are you the one that should come? If the herald of his mission did not recognize what was happening, how could the self-serving people understand what it was all about? But Jesus didn't say anything right away. He allowed them to just stay in his presence, these two disciples, and as they were watching, there were sick people that were being brought to Jesus. There were blind people that were groping their way through the crowd. There were people with all manner of diseases that were coming to him. And the voice of the mighty healer penetrated the deaf ear. The person could hear again. It only took a word or a touch of his hand to open the eyes of the blind so that they beheld the light of day for the first time. They saw the scenes of nature and the faces of their friends which they had never seen. They saw the face of their deliverer, their savior. They heard Jesus, these two disciples that had been sent by John, they heard Jesus rebuke disease and banish fever. They saw and heard his voice reaching the ears of those that were dying and they arose in health and vigor. They saw people brought to him who were paralyzed and who were insane. <clears throat> they saw them obey his word and their madness left them and they worshiped him. And at the same time while Jesus was healing the diseases of the people, he was teaching them. There were poor peasants and laborers who had been shunned by the rabbis who were coming to Jesus and he was teaching them concerning the kingdom of God. He spoke to them the words of eternal life. It's recorded like this, Jesus answered, says Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Jesus told the disciples of John to go back to him with this response. And when they told him what they had seen and heard, John the Baptist understood something that the rest of the people did not understand. He got the message that the kingdom of Christ was not to be established by the clash of arms or the overturning of thrones and kingdoms, 
but by Jesus speaking to the hearts of men and women and living before them a life of mercy and self-sacrifice. This was to him convincing evidence of Christ's divinity. He recognized that he was simply drinking the cup of suffering and sorrow ahead of time, the same cup that Jesus himself would drain clear to the bottom. He understood now more clearly the nature of Christ's mission, and he yielded himself to God for life or from death, or for death. After the disciples of John had left, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, it says in Matthew 11, starting with the seventh verse, verse, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus contrasted the life of John the Baptist with the life of the Jewish leaders. Rich apparel and the luxuries of life were not the portion of God's servants then, and they are not the portion of God's servants now in this world. Those people, Jesus said, are living in king's courts. Of course, just like it is today, it was then, there were people that were more interested in gaining admiration from men than in gaining purity of heart, which would win the approval of God. What is real greatness according to heaven? Jesus said, there has not arisen anyone who is born of women greater than John the Baptist. What is greatness according to the estimation of heaven? What is it? Is it wealth? No, John the Baptist wasn't wealthy. Is it rank? John the Baptist had no rank. Would it be noble descent or intellectual power? Well, if we were going to worship those people who had the greatest intellectual power, if that was the only criteria, we would end up worshiping the devil. Satan has intellectual power which no man has ever equaled. The Old Testament says it was beyond even Daniel. But what is it that God values? It is moral worth. Love and purity are the characteristics that he prizes most. John came to herald the Savior's first advent. And although it looked like his mission was defeated or not a success, it actually was a success. Later on, the people recognized and said, everything that John said about this man is true. John the Baptist was the connecting link between the old covenant dispensation and the new covenant dispensation. He hadn't fully comprehended the mission of the Savior, and his was a lonely lot. He was not permitted to see the results of his labors. And in that sense, those who did get to see the works of Christ were more highly privileged than John the Baptist. But because of his blameless life, the people thought that no violent measures would be taken against him. But when Herod's birthday was kept, it says in Matthew, the 14th chapter and the 6th verse, when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. It talks about this same event in Mark, the 6th chapter. It says that an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. When this happened, Herodias decided that this was her opportune time. She knew that there was going to be feasting and drinking. She knew that their minds would not be clear on that occasion. And so she had a plan. She sent her daughter, who had just re reached puberty, who had just reached that age of life when she would be sexually very attractive and, and voluptuous. 
she sent this daughter, Salome, to dance before them. And what it says here is when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Well, the king was very sorry at this request. And right away, the riotous mirth ceased. There was an ominous silence that descended on the party. The king was horror-stricken at doing something like this. But his word had been pledged, and he didn't, he didn't want to look like he was fickle or rash. Now, the oath had been made in the honor of his guests, so he hesitated to give anyone there an opportunity to release him from his oath. He gave them opportunity to speak in the prisoner's behalf. Some of these people had traveled long distances to hear John preach, and they knew that he was not guilty of any crime. They knew he was an innocent man. But although they were shocked at the girl's request, they were too besotted with liquor to interpose a rebuke or a remonstrance against her request. There was no voice that was raised to save the life of heaven's messengers. These men were men who were leaders in the kingdom. Upon them there rested grave responsibilities, and by their silence they pronounced the sentence of death upon the prophet of God to satisfy the revenge of an abandoned woman. How often has the life of the innocent been sacrificed because of the intemperance of those who should be the guardians of justice? The Bible says that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20 verse 1. It is through the use of alcoholic beverages that often it has happened, as the Bible says in Isaiah 59, that judgment is turned away backward, and he that departs from evil makes himself a prey, makes himself a target. Actually, if the truth were known, even today, those who have the jurisdiction over the lives of their fellow men should be held guilty of a crime if they yield to intemperance. Anyone who executes the laws of any government should be a temperate man or woman. He should be or she should be a law keeper. They should be people of self-control who have full command of their physical, mental, and moral powers so that they may have a correct and right sense of justice. Well, what happened? What happened was in just a little while, as it says here in John or in Mark 6:26, it says, "The king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her, and immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. What was the result of this crime? Did Herodias gain any joy and pleasure because she had succeeded in killing an innocent man? Well, no, she didn't gain happiness because her name became abhor, abhorred and hated and notorious throughout the whole country. Not only that, after this, Herod was more tormented by remorse than he had been before. His sin was ever before him. He had the accusings of a guilty conscience. He found no rest. He was anxious in heart. He knew, John had told him, that nothing was hidden from God. That's what the Old Testament teaches. Read Psalm 39. He was convinced that God was present in every place. He was convinced that God had seen exactly what he had done and he had, that God had witnessed the revelry in the banqueting room. And now what John had preached to him spoke more clearly to his conscience than it had before. 
He was in constant fear that John would be raised from the dead and come and avenge his death and pass condemnation on him and his house. In his life, after that was fulfilled, the prophecy that Moses gave in Deuteronomy 28, it says, Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In the morning you shall say, Oh, that it were evening. And at evening you shall say, Oh, that it were morning. Because of the fear which terrifies your heart and because of the sight which your eyes see. Oh, friend, that's the experience that Herod experienced as a result of his sin. You see, the sinner's own thoughts are his accusers. And there can be no torture any worse than the sting of a guilty conscience that gives a person no rest day or night. There are many people even today that study this story and say, how could God allow this? How could God allow John the Baptist to meet such a fate? Stay tuned and we'll see why. Sometimes studying the Bible on your own without any help or a guideline to follow can be a little difficult. And after confusion and frustration set in, we all too often turn to other things. If this sounds like you, you're not alone. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence School is just the answer. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for your free Bible Correspondence Starter Pack. I really enjoy being able to study at home. I'm a new Christian and I definitely knew I needed some guidance. Simply review each lesson and answer the questions. These studies were great. It just seemed like the Bible opened up for me. Then send the completed lesson back to us in the envelope provided. These studies were very professional. They didn't take a lot of time, and I really appreciated that. A Bible teacher will then look over each lesson and send them back to you with the next set of studies. It's that simple and totally free. Call Steps to Life Television at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. I'm so glad I called. Many minds are perplexed by the mystery of what happened to John the Baptist. It is a dark providence that our human vision cannot penetrate, but we could never lose faith in God because of what, of what happened, because John the Baptist was simply one of the first to share in Christ's sufferings. Have you ever thought, friend, that everyone who is saved in the kingdom of heaven will wear a crown of sacrifice. Those who follow Christ will be misunderstood in this world by selfish men. They will be made a mark for the fierce assaults of Satan because Satan's kingdom is established to destroy the principle of self-sacrifice, the principle of Christ's kingdom that Satan hates. Satan will war against the principle of self sacrifice wherever it is manifested. When John came preaching the repentance that the Jews needed to be ready for the Messiah, Satan was afraid for his kingdom because the sinfulness of sin was revealed in such a manner that men trembled and Satan's power over many people was broken. The devil was angry over this, and as a result, since he could not get John the Baptist to sin, he couldn't entice him to sin, he decided to cause him to suffer. Now, Jesus could have interposed to deliver his servant, but not only did he know that John would bear the test, but there was another reason that Jesus did not place himself in this dangerous position to deliver John the Baptist. It was for the sake of thousands of other people who were going to live in after years who would pass from prison to death. Some by the sword, some by burning at the stake, some on the rack. But whatever form it was, John was to drink the cup of martyrdom, to be an encouragement to those who in later ages would suffer martyrdom, apparently forsaken by God and man. When that would happen, what a stay it would be to their hearts to remember that John the Baptist, to whose faithfulness Jesus Christ himself had borne witness, had passed through a similar experience. Satan was permitted to cut short the earthly life of the messenger of the Messiah. 
but he could not touch the life that was hidden with Christ in God, as you read in Colossians 3, 3. He brought sorrow upon Christ, but he could not conquer John. In this warfare, Satan was revealing his true character. Before the witnessing universe, he made it manifest is of his enmity against God and man by killing, having an innocent man killed. Although there was no miraculous deliverance that was granted to John, he was not forsaken. He always had the companionship of heavenly angels who opened to him the prophecies concerning Christ, the precious promises of the scripture. And these were his stay, as they were to be the stay of God's people in future ages to John the Baptist, as to those who came after him, was given the assurance that Jesus gave to his disciples before he left in Matthew 28, 20. Jesus said, Behold, I am with you all the days, even unto the end of the age. God never leads his children. Otherwise, then they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning, and if they could discern the glory of the purpose that they are working out as co-servants with Christ. Oh, friend, God has called his children in this world. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is the fundamental difference between Satan's kingdom and Christ's kingdom. Those who choose to follow Christ, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. That, that person who was the most highly honored of heaven was not Enoch who was translated or not Elijah who was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. Neither of those people were more honored or were greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said, there has not been born any one of women who is greater than this man. John the Baptist, the greatest of all who were born of women, according to Jesus' own statement, he perished alone in the dungeon. We call to mind in this regard the statement of the Apostle Paul to the believers in Philippians, in, the, in Philippi, that place where Saul, Paul himself had been cast into prison after he had been beaten up when he had done nothing wrong. And he wrote to these people in Philippi and he said, Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians 1.9 And of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men, fellowship with Christ and his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honor. Today's free book is entitled, Darkness Before Dawn. To receive your free copy, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer IM23. This powerful book describes in vivid detail the coming world crisis, what the issues will be, why and how most of the world will be deceived, the plain evidence from the Bible that will keep you from being deceived, and the secret of spiritual strength. Have you ever wondered why so many innocent people suffer? Why has there been such a decline in moral values in society? Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. If your world is spinning out of control and you need to be able to make sense out of what you see happening around you, call and get your free copy of Darkness Before Dawn. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer IM23. Call now. Steps to life. We hope you have been as blessed by today's message as we have been in bringing it to you. We encourage you to contact us at Steps to Life Television with any questions or comments you might have. Check one, two. Check one, two. Don't forget to ask for today's free offer. Ready in five. Steps four. to Life Television, a ministry preparing a people for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Welcome, friends. He can change your life.